Okay. Good. Good. Man, I'm worn out just setting up for the class. Whew. Lisa and I were sipping coffee this morning. Oh, well, okay, we're live. Let's just start. I'll have to uh, come back to that story later. Thank you for tuning in, you all. This is Waters Garden Center, our summer series of garden classes. Today's class is very specialized. It's not for everyone. Not everyone wants fruit trees. Some want low maintenance. Some just want privacy. Just Some just want their hot tub better protected. Some just want fruit trees. Anything edible is off the charts this year because I think the cost of produce, just food, food in general is skyrocketing. And you can grow this stuff in your backyard super easy. So we're going to go over the fruit side of things. Trees, I did pull some vines, some uh, brambles, berries, and some pomegranates, figs, kind of the, the edible things I kind of brought together. Uh, and that's what we're going to discuss. Food, water, varieties, because that's the most important thing, and then how to plant them. Okay, all in about 50 minutes or less. I'll leave time for Q&A. It's a small enough class, and I think we can maybe do Q&A on the fly. We'll see. If I can't, I'll shut you down and go, at the end. We're doing that at the end. So, But we'll try. So it's, I'd rather do it on the fly because it's, it's funner. I don't know. Okay, so who am I in sequence? Now, I had, to, I had to wear this garb because I just recorded the podcast and the radio show yesterday in my cowboy hat and my sequence. That could go down wrong on the internet. So I thought I would explain that, what's going on. Okay, so we're in Prescott, Arizona. What are we famous for on the 4th of July? The rodeo. You gotta pull out the rodeo, the buckles, all that kind of stuff, because this is our time to shine. And I'm the ultimate cowboy. I like being outdoors in the sunshine. I got my cowboy hat. Uh, so I thought I'd wear that. And then the sequence, I've never had a sequence anything before until this year. I've been saying no for seven years now. No, no, no. Seven years of no. Finally, uh, Alex Heineman, he is the CEO or the, the, the guy that runs a Boys and Girls Club. So I've been saying no to Alex for seven years, and he finally comes in. and He talks to my wife now, not to me. He sent board members after me. He's come after me directly. I keep going, no. You talk to my wife, and she gathers up all the staff and they all meet to collude on this and say, go, Ken, you've got a meeting about a month ago inside the store. I'm going, no, I don't. I know who I have meetings with and I don't have a meeting. You know, no, no, you need to come in here. And so the entire staff, we all wear blue aprons. There's like 20 of them wrapped up in a horseshoe. And Alex comes in with a boom box playing disco music going with flowers, of course, going, now will you dance? And so there's only one answer to that it's yes so i said yes this year so the boys and girls club great organizations we've got two clubs one in prescott valley one in prescott we need a third one in prescott it's getting pretty busy here um they host a not fundraiser every year it's called dancing for the star not with the stars you're dancing for the stars the stars are the kids so for the stars it's a local talent thing they get personalities who knows everyone they want to use our network of course you all and then they, I don't know how to dance. So I know I'm theatrical. I like a camera, I like a microphone, but I can't dance. Uh, so they partner you up with a professional dancer, choreographer. So my choreographer is Carrie Hughes. She's a high energy gal too. She owns a ranch event center out in Dewey. Uh, her husband's the mayor of Dewey. So she's a strong advocate of Boys and Girls Club. She's danced all seven years and they partnered her with me. So this should be pretty energetic. Anyway, that's in August. That's what this flyer is for here. And you win, you have to dance well. That's it. And you got to do more than dance. Like the stage, this is Yavapai College, the biggest stage in this in the county, right there. You can't just dance as a couple. You got to fill up the stage. And so it's going to be like uh, I've got a staff member that's that's famous on TikTok. We're doing backflips. He works for me. I'm his side gig. His real gig is he does online stuff, but he lives right here. And so he said, hey, Lance, will you do a backflip in the middle of my show? Come up front and center, wear the same outfit, stunt double, backflip and back right out. He goes, yeah, I'll do that for you. So we got backflips. We got 
dropping from the ceiling. We've got shopping carts full of flowers dancing around those. It's going to be a spectacle. I'm trying to see if I can get flames. I think there'll be pyrotechnics. We'll see what happens. That'll fill the stage up. So that's August 25th and 26th. Please come. I will be dancing well, but you win by sponsorships, getting companies to support you. I'm almost at 35,000 now, so just about to break that. You win by, if you go to the event, you can say, I want my tickets to go towards, and I get credit for that. And then uh, by voting, this is for the vote. Just here, just give me 20 bucks or give them 20 bucks, and I get credit for that. As you check out today, if you check out, I hope you do, they're going to ask you, would you like to donate something to the Boys and Girls Club, even a dollar or whatever? Some people donate 100 bucks, some people donate 20, some people 50 cents, they round up. That's what that is, and that's why I'm in sequence. We got to cover this one. Let's just get this out of the way. Today only, because you all are interested in fruit trees, 10% off all fruit trees. Anything we talk about today, anything that fruits, not anything, strawberries, not, but all the berries, figs, pomegranates, kiwis, apples, pears, cherry, all those are 10% off. Okay, so that'll cover the cost of all your mulch and steaks and all the other stuff. So that's this. Just today, don't come in tomorrow because the crew tomorrow won't know about it. Just a crew today. And then we got to cover this. Let's just start with this, the water guide. I gave you my business card and I am Ken Lane. I own the garden center. My wife and I own the garden center. So Ken Lane comes to own Waters Garden Center because I married a Waters. Harold Waters had four very pretty daughters. And I took a liking to the, to the youngest one, I think the prettiest. And so we, we married 35 years ago. And then Harold and Lorna retired 20 years ago, and we took it and just has been running it ever since. And now we have uh, Mackenzie Lane. You'll see her floating around, very tall, very pretty gal. That's our daughter, and she's training to take the third generation. So how to, how to run the garden center. She's well-educated. She just needs to know all the pieces. And so that's kind of who I am, okay? I've got, I should mention it just so in case my kids are tuned in. I hope you are, Jeremy. You typically are. Anyway, um, I've also got two other daughters. So Mackenzie has an identical twin who's five minutes younger than her. So she was born first, Mackenzie's born last. So Megan, she lives in uh, San Antonio. Our son, who's the next, he is a uh, uh, captain in the army. He's at Fort Sam Houston, that's San Antonio. And then I've got a daughter, my oldest, who just gave birth to a two month old grandson. We're very excited. Um, you've already been to visit twice. So she lives in Austin. Kate lives in Austin. She's married with Jeremy. So anyway, that's our family. Okay. They've all worked in the garden center, every single one of them. Okay. Now how to water. So my secret goal in, I go up against the big box stores. That's my main competitors, Depot and Lowe's. Those are the big boys. I compete against them. Uh, they can't do what I do. And that is tell you how to water. They can't sell trees that are mature enough to actually fruit this year. They're selling whips because you're going after price, not after nice established trees. They're selling desert varieties instead of mountain varieties. We'll go over that in a second. So they, they're just saying, send 10 of those to all my stores. They don't care if it's in Flagstaff or Prescott or Kingman or Tucson or wherever. They just send them all. We only sell varieties that are for here. And they can't tell you how to water. I can my goal is to get my logo in every single irrigation box or garden journal in the county. And so this is meant to tape right there. And you'll see in the front, it says tape inside irrigation box. Because you'll forget, now when do, I, when do I turn this off again? When do I turn it on? And so this is meant to help you. So established trees, you'll see the top line. Established trees, shrubs, roses, vines, things with big roots. You're watering and establish things once a week for a long time if you're using drip system. So drips are drip, 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 micro irrigation. You need to run that emitter for about an hour just to get one gallon of water on it. Well, a big tree like this is a five gallon tree. It needs about five gallons of water a week. You need to run that system for five hours with one emitter or maybe two, three hours with two emitters. So you might have to double up on emitters for bigger trees. Um, for a bigger tree like this, it's a 15 gallon. This is an instantaneous, what is this, apple tree. It's already forming apples. So trees need to be about seven years old before they're old enough to start to fruit. There's a maturity thing. 
You got enough roots and, and fruit and wood to start producing that fruit for trees. Berries are less, but fruit trees need to be at least five to seven years old before they start to. So if you planted something in the past and it took like three years to, to grow, to start fruiting, that's why. It was an immature tree. It just wasn't old enough. It just needs to go, or it's pollination. We'll go over that too. So this will need about 15 gallons of water per week. So there you might need to put on two or three emitters and run that system. I would say an hour and a half, two hours minimum. Sometimes you want to push that water down and then a little bit deeper through the root zone. So it takes a lot of that dripping. It looks like a little spot like this, but as it goes into the soil, it forms a, a teardrop. That's the shape within the soil that it takes on. So it looks dry up here, but it's moist down here. If you water it that long, it's going to hydrate the entire root zone down below. Especially if you got a two or three emitters, it's really gonna hydrate. If you do that well, it'll take days and days before the soil starts to dry out. So that's the goal. If you water a fruit tree, especially frequent and not very much, it's gonna penetrate about four or six inches down. And then the tree is gonna sacrifice the lower, it's gonna dry out the lower roots and so you have a real shallow rooted fruit tree. What will happen is about three to five years out, it's going to load up with fruit. I mean, it's going to be like, whoa, this is impressive. But you got a shallow rooted tree, you get a windstorm in July, and that tree will just literally will just fall over. It, you, you watch. You'll see that this is a good fruit year. This will happen as soon as the monsoons happen. So which will be in about anyway, any time the rains can come of summer. Typically, the locals kind of use July 4th, I think actually meteorologists use the end of June, but generally by the July 4th, we're gonna see afternoon rains. At least the clouds come, the humidity goes up. You can tell the plants are happier because they get some shade, some humidity, so they start to perk up a little bit. It's actually a second growing season for us, that, that monsoon season. Well, that's also when you get those violent afternoon winds and possibly hailstorms. So you kind of want to watch out. You want a deep rooted plant, not a shallow rooted plant. And the secret is less often, but longer, deeper. Okay. So that's what this is kind of saying. That was perfect. How do I water with a hose? So a good, good test on this is one inch of water will penetrate approximately six inches, six inches of soil. Okay. If it's sand, it's a little bit more. If it's clay, it's a little bit less. But on average, one inch, one to six, that's how far it'll deep. So that'll help you as you put your, your water basin around that. Oh, I've got a deep rooted. How many inches of water do I need on the top of this? Oh, about three inches. That'll penetrate this whole thing plus a little bit more. Obviously, tomatoes, that's far less. Berries, it's far less because they have a little bit shallower rooted. But most of these fruiting plants have a pretty substantial root structure. And so you want to plant, you want to water deeper. It'll help you. Yeah. Uh, so she, for you folks online, I'm like, where am I at on the camera? Am I still okay? Or where? It's like a little bit off. Um, so... How, she's 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 taking her plants. She's got some pavers around it, and so how much should she fill that basin up with the pavers? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can get you close. No one can tell you exactly how to water. All I'm doing is getting you close. Every, in fact, my front yard is different than my backyard. I got this super heavy clay in the back, and it's a north slope. So I've got this big two-story house, classic overlooking the dells. They dug into the side of the hill. And like, you got to walk down a flight and a half of stairs just to get to the backyard. So it's shaded. And so that area doesn't dry out as quickly as the front yard, which is more raised beds by the streets, driveways. It's hotter, radiant heat. And the soil is different. As that soil band goes, it changes. But I can get it close. I use this. Right now, I've got most of my backyard is native -y kind of things. So I'm wondering about every 10 days, those things. Because I want my desert willows to keep blooming and looking fantastic. I know they can go on their own, but I don't, I'm a gardener. I'm controlling these naturally, these natural plants and I want them to be rock stars all the time with a little bit of care they can be over the top. So my desert willows can bloom nonstop from now through fall. We just a little bit of care. So, so a little bit of water and food goes a long ways. 
And so my front yard is glorious, like you spend your time out front because it's an oasis. It is not native. It is high water, high use, high beauty. You just want to sit there and watch the hummingbirds and butterflies because that's where they hang out. That's the front yard. It's a smaller area, but it's been designed to be this little private secret garden. So I've got my spot that needs more care, and then I have my other areas where we just entertain. And it better be ready to go like now because I'm not spending any time to take care of you. The yuccas will keep blooming for the next three months. Just keep doing that. Uh, so butterfly bush, they just keep blooming. They're back there in the front yard. It's petunias and geraniums, that kind of stuff. In my For my edible things, I do a lot of containers and even more raised beds. My soil is up in the Dells, uh, up in the high, um, Eagle Ridge area, up above the high school. That is the hardest gardening I have ever done. And I've farmed all over the county. That's the hardest I've ever done. I've got it. I've, I've killed a lot of stuff. But I figured out how to do it. And that's kind of the stuff that we share on, on Saturday classes. And so what I've done is I've got like a peach tree right now that shades my hot tub. It's in a big container, but it's a standard size fruit tree. It's got fruit on it right now. And so it's been in there for 10 years or more. And that's my second tree in there. I had, a, I had a cherry tree for the first 10 years and finally outgrew its space. This one's starting to get, it's got a substantial trunk on it. Uh, so starting, I might have to replace it again and start over again, but 10 years in a container pot, that's eh, pretty good. So I'm, I'm happy with that, just sucking. So when you do that, plant it in potting soil. Just don't, don't take soil out of your garden and put it into a pot. The trees won't be as happy with that. What we start these in is water's potting soil, especially the smaller ones. As they get a little bit bigger, we'll shift them into something not quite as good, but water, potting soil is made for pots. It's the science is in potting soil. Compost is, there's no science. Pile it high, let it compost for about a year, turn it a couple times, screen it, bag it up and sell it. That's mulch, that's different. Potting soil is your exact amount of uh, organics, uh, peat moss, there's a food, there's perlite, there's white uh, specks for drainage. There's a, there's a recipe, and I've been perfecting our recipe for 20 years now, trying to get it where it grows the best, because it's like a razor's edge. You want it to stay moist, but dry out so the roots can get through it. It's like it's hard to get that balance right. So we've been tweaking that recipe for years, trying to get it just right, and nothing grows better than that. Water's potting soil. We put it side by side every few years to see which brand does best. Ours always comes on top. So anyway, that's potted potting soil. That'll get you years down the road. Okay. Okay. So let me go reset. Are we done with watering? We can answer. We got you. So just think one inch. Your drip system is not made to water your plants. Your drip system is life support. That is it. It gets you through nature's natural water, which is the life-giving force of all landscape plants. Drip simply bridges the gap between, it's a life support getting it just enough until the next rains come. So we've got a little dry spot, but we haven't had seen any moisture for, what, a month? It'll be a few more weeks, so you got to get it through six, eight weeks, and then finally the monsoons come, and that's the rain that's really going to make the plants grow and do well. Okay, so that's what this is for. Are we said I'm going to put this down and go moving on and then I'm going to take his question. He's been so patient first. I want to go ladies first, but you've been. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So good question. So he's using a horse trough. You folks, I know you're online. I want you to take a look. Just take a moment. Will you go to Facebook? Type in Waters Garden Center and like us, will you? Follow us. You'll get some great garden content there. Plus, we're streaming right now through Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Okay, horse troughs. Can I go in horse troughs? And should I pull the drain plug? They all come with drain plugs. So, yes, all containers need a drain. Or it will simply fill up with water and drown your plant. Eventually, it will drown your plant. It might take a couple months for a big trough, but it will eventually drain your plant. It'll just drown it. Unless you're growing like water lilies, horsetails, 
mint, you can't kill mint. I think nuclear holocaust, there's only, there's only red ants and mint left, that's it. So, but those things, I'd say pull the, pull, just pull the drain plug, the one that's at, there's usually it's got a two inch at the bottom, just pull it out, that's enough. So containers, so you said, is, this, is it the same for container gardens as it is for in the ground gardens? So potted plants are a little bit different. So this is mainly established plants are for in the ground, and I've got all the yard to root out into. If you're confining the roots in a horse trough or big pot or container, the rules change. Hold on. Yes, we're right by Iron Springs Road. 1815 Iron Springs Road, come on down and see us, but it's also loud right now. So, uh, so this, it may change. So my containers right now, my bigger plants, I'm watering every three days, just me. Horse trough is a little bigger, maybe it's every four days. So I like looking at certain plants, like uh, strawberries. They're really good. I'll use that as an underplanting for some of my trees because they just look pretty over, over containers. And they're like, they're beautiful and they're delicious. So I use those quite a bit to my underplantings of like the peach tree it has strawberries underneath. It pulls the pollinators, it looks pretty, it keeps going. Uh, but anyway, they're also very, they're crybabies. If they get dry, they start weeping and complaining. So I go, oh, okay, that's my cue. It's been, it's been four days. It looks like I'm on a four day cycle. As we get up into the 90 degrees, which we're due any moment, we sort of need it to be 90 for it to pull in the moisture. Kind of there's a heat thing that happens. Anyway, it might do it every two or three days. I try to go as long as I can, but then as you're watering a container, the secret is water it until you see moisture coming out the bottom or in the saucer or in the water all the way to till water's coming out. And that way, you know, you've got the entire soil band watered. Does that make sense? Okay, good question. Was there a second one? You said there's two, they've got it? This was probably about five years. This is probably seven or eight, something like that. Yeah, they're both, they're both, they probably both, they might both have fruit. You'll see fruit in the racks. We only carry, we know who you are. You're at Waters Garden Center. Okay, we're, there's cheaper places. We understand. We're not, we don't want to be that cheaper place. We want to be the better place. So all of our trees, we're not shopping for price. We're shopping for age and fruitability right now. So all the plants that we have are a fruiting age like right now. If I had a nickel for every time I heard, I don't, I don't, I'm old, I'm older, not old, I'm a young retiree. We call them active retirees. We're active retiree and I don't want to wait anymore. I got time and money and I don't want to wait till next year, but I want now. So if I had a nickel for every time I heard, I want it now. I don't want to wait for it to grow. I want it now. We try to bring you now. So you'll see fruit in the racks. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah. So she's got clay. She's asking, how long should I run it if I have clay soil? I do too, I've got clay soil. So it takes longer to push so that the, the particles are real tight. So it takes longer to push that water through all that soil. Um, first of all, dig a hole that's at least as deep as the root ball. So you've got, and you wanna amend it so we can get the roots through all that. So planting technique, we'll get on that in just a minute. But still, you should water that long. What you'll find with clay soil though is you don't have to water as often. So you can go longer between watering. If, you, if you're deep watering, it takes longer for clay soil to dry out than a, than a sandy or granity soil. So the closer you are to Granite Mountain, the more sandy, crushed granite it gets. They've got a hard pan about, I don't know, 18, 24 inches down and it's just solid rock. But that first bit where the roots are, that's pretty sandy, it dries out faster. You have to fertilize more often than clay soil. You fertilize less often. So anyway, that's I would say yes. Yeah, start with that. Then maybe you could back yours off to every seven, eight, nine. Sometimes on ten days between watering. The secret too with for fruit trees: make sure you're watering in the winter. Don't let your landscaper turn that system off in in October, November. And don't turn it back on until April. You will not get as much fruit by doing that. And you'll have death and decay by doing that. So this year was unusual, super unusual. We had record amounts of rain. I've never, never seen anything like it. In fact, it's been really good for business. 
because it killed a lot of plants. They just rotted in the ground. A lot of yuccas, agaves, the cacti, they just died. Butterfly bush, I lost some salvias. It just drowned them. This winter was really wet. Most winters, there's a dry gap. There's a, like, typically December, January, first part of, of February is very dry and very cold. If a plant is dry and it goes through a cold spell, you will get winter burn or winter kill. And it will take the flower buds off of your fruit trees. And so it won't fruit as well the next spring or have less blossoms or the tips will not be dyed back. So if you simply water, and that's on that card, water a couple times a month. In the winter, if we don't, if we get a storm, you can cut one of those out, but at least hydrate it. And here's the insider tip. I just, my name's Ken. We're just friends. We're, we're, we're neighbors talking over the back fence. This is working for me. I think it'll work for you. Okay. If I, if I hear a real cold snap is coming, I go out and I hydrate my plants before the storm gets here. And you'll know what it is because oh, the weatherman just gives, he spooks us all. Oh my gosh, people run to the grocery store. They take all the toilet paper, all the soup, all the, there's empty aisles. You know what the event is. They're, they're hunkering down for like a month long siege. It's like they're in Minnesota or something. It's only gonna be a two day event. Yeah, but it's still, before that event happens, I try to hydrate all my plants because a hydrated plant goes through cold much better than a dry plant. It's kind of counterintuitive, but there's antifreeze up and down the structure of the plants. As long as the water is there, it can keep it flowing. It keeps that antifreeze active. If it gets dry, it starts to bring that antifreeze down towards the heart of the plant to keep the heart alive, and it will sacrifice the outer edges. This is really important for hedges and that kind of stuff. So, because they're they're really thick and full, like red tip botania, it we're, they're noted for winter burn if you don't water them, because the tops will just burn right off. Luckily, most times you whack them back, fertilize them, and they'll come back. But just winter watering, game changer for edible things. Also, watch your watering more carefully as plants have fruit on them. They're more sensitive. If they lack some moisture, what they will do is they will take the moisture out of the fruit to keep the mother plant, to keep the core of the plant alive, and they'll shed that fruit. Now, I am seeing in my own peaches mainly right now, uh, my peach trees are dropping some fruits. So we call it June drop very very common don't worry it's natural for especially pitted fruits the bigger plums nectarines apricots peaches it's very common for them to drop some fruit in june and what's happening is it's the the uh, tree is calibrating for the moisture that it has how much fruit it has it's, it's shedding some so it can keep keep the keep the fruit alive so it's taking the weak ones, dropping them so it can keep all that energy into the bigger ones. Now, some plants like apples and pears, they don't drop enough. You probably need to prune even more of those off. Just thumb prune. So you have an apple, they'll cluster up in four or five, three, four, five, six apples on a cluster. There's no way one branch can handle six fruits. Impossible. So what you'll end up being is a whole lot of little tiny apples like crab apples. Now, what happened? What's going on? If you simply thin out all but maybe two of those fruits, take the weakest ones, just pick them right off and leave the remaining ones, all the energy goes into, and you get a nice big apple. That's the secret. So peaches are kind of that way. You can have way too many peaches and all you get are pits with a little bit of skin on them. If you thin some of them out, it helps you get a bigger, nicer, juicy peach to it. So thinning, June drop is normal. We always get calls going, oh my gosh, something's going on, it's June where it's okay, watch your watering, and then maybe thin some more out. So I'll just kind of leave you with that. Yes, something on June drop, really? You're back on watering, aren't you? <laughs> ah, so good, how does she adjust for monsoons? So I do an entire class on nothing but drip systems and we go an hour, sometimes longer. So, uh, so monsoons, so don't worry don't adjust your clock for natural occurrences. A monsoon rain, so she's asking for you folks online because you didn't hear that. How does she adjust her clock for monsoon rain? Okay, don't, just keep it going. Most of the monsoon rains that we get come down so, it's torrential, I mean, it's just all at once. Most of that water runs off 
downstream. It doesn't doesn't saturate in the winter rains, snows. They tend to they tend to soak in really really deep. The monsoon rains don't. It's very rare, unless you get consistent afternoons out more and more and more rain. I just keep my drip system going. What I actually look at is I look at my my rain of monsoon as a way to push my natural irrigation down even deeper because it's going to push my natural moisture that I, that I irrigate with a little bit deeper and it's and it's hydrating all the surrounding soil so the plants will be happier with that so i don't i try not to adjust it so and then don't play with times figure out how long it takes you to water those plants that like that yard then never adjust that time again you're only going to play with how frequent that takes a variable out. This is like rocket science degrees, the, the irrigation. It's like, it's crazy man stuff. Just figure out how long it takes to make your plants happy and then play with how many days can I go before I have to run it again? Then you'd only deal with one variable. That's way easier than, oh, and I need to adjust to 60 minutes instead of 90. And oh my God, and then I'm only at three days. And so if I, oh my gosh, go frequency. Just focus on frequency. It's, it'll, it makes life easier. Did I, did I answer, answer that enough? Yeah. Don't adjust it. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Ken. Appreciate that. So we have a couple handouts for you. Do I have those? You've got them. I've got a, I wrote a fruit tree book that's for local varieties. This is not just some downloaded Google garb. I didn't use chatbots to do it. It's actually our information for us. It's our varieties. And the key thing is we cover watering, planting. Key thing is pollination. Which tree needs? I put together a chart that says Honeycrisp needs this variety to cross-pollinate. Okay, that'll be a big help for you. A lot of times our fruits do not. Um, and I'm going to give that to you with your email. So you'll see a link to that. It's a free book. It's like 50 pages. It's just fruits, just us. Also, how to plant, how to water, although you all have the water business card with folks online. You're seeing those links already in there in the chat area. Go ahead and download those directly. And I had one other. Oh, I know some of you are using contractors to help you install. I put, I'm gonna give you my contractor guide. Listen, I want it planted like this. I want this many emitters. I want it to put space on either side. It's the directions we give contractors on how to properly plant, stake a tree, okay? So I'll, I'll give that to you too. And help, if you're planting yourself, you probably already know, cause we're gonna give you the actual handout guide contractors are they take shortcuts they want to get in they want to get out they don't do it right this will help you guide them correctly and go here just put this many meters for this size for this size tree i think it'll help you okay for you those of you doing it yourself it might help you too i don't know so that's what i'm going to give you here it'll be a digital format um and it'll be in your inbox by what do you think monday ken something like that so in a couple days so maybe today depending on how busy i am we'll see but monday at the latest okay Okay, so email, that's what that's for. If you're part of our garden club already, it's not its not all 12,000 people are gonna get this. Only you're gonna get it. So I don't wanna pollute everyone's inbox that doesn't care about fruit trees, just, just you all care. All right, there was another, okay. I'm gonna reset onto food. We're done with watering. Any other questions before I move to food? You're very needy in the front row. This is this is question three for you. This is my best So in, in containers, this is super easy. So what kind of soil do I need for containers? Now a trough is huge. If you have several of those, some many people have like, yeah, many, many of them. So you probably have four yards of soil sitting there. So for you, you can use some filler junk in the bottom as long as it drains. The top layer where the roots are gonna be needs to be water's potting soil. Plants do not like to change soils. They don't want to see something different. You don't like jumping out of an airplane in Phoenix and you go from that beautiful, you know, 72 degrees they have it set to, sometimes it's like 65, it's like freezing inside a plane. You jump out of Phoenix in, in the summer, or Palm Springs, or in the desert, you're going, oh my gosh, I'm gonna die. Uh, plants do the same thing with soil. If they get into a different kind of soil, they're gonna go, I don't, I don't like this, this is not good. And so you want to get the, as close as you can to the same. Water's potting soil is exactly the same. So it's going to root out and just go faster. So that top layer 
If it's a smaller container, fill the whole thing up with soil. Here's an insider tip. So I, I've got over 50 containers, most of them big. I've had them for decades. Do not listen to the internet and stop watching TikTok. This doesn't look like the TikTok crowd. This looks like the Facebook, Instagram crowd, but the same information gets polluted. It gets regurgitated across the, the social media platforms. Fill them up with styrofoam, fill them up with Coke cans, take water bottles. Duh, for the love of gardening, don't do that, okay? You want as much soil as you can. The more soil you have, the more sponge holding, water holding, um, it just takes the edge off for the plants. And as we get hotter, the plants can actually wick up water to the roots if you give it some soil. If you're filling that up with water bottles, there's no water down there. There's nothing to wick. So it'll get you an extra day or two of, of uh, moisture. Uh, it'll take the error factor and put it in your favor instead of the plant dying's favor. It'll, it's a game changer. For my smaller plants, I tend to put a saucer underneath my pots. If you're filling it up straight with, with soil, and I got a whole class of nothing but container gardens. So this is really, it's a 90 second elevator speech. I'll fill it up with soil, put a saucer underneath it. I'm watering till the water comes out and fills the saucer because I just created my own self-watering container. As the plant dries, it can actually wick that water back up into the soil as long as it's continual soil. If it changes, if there's any kind of layering, it won't do that. It'll, it'll just, it just can't, it can't wick up, okay? There's some other secrets. You can take a sock, you can take all kinds of stuff and create a wick. I find if you just take soil, soil is the wick. It will do it for you. You don't have to do any kind of TikToky trick things. This is just gardening. It doesn't have to be complicated. It seems like social media just makes it. If you do a Google search anymore, you are dumbfounded by all the gardening. Program. It's crazy. Okay. How are we doing on time? I see your senior watch. Making sure we're doing okay. Oh, oh, no watch. Oh, that's good. Okay. So I can keep going for this. Is what I do for a living. So I do this all day long. Let's go over variety, shall we? Let's go. No, I said food. Let's go over food. You should fertilize your plants. There you go. Actually, we should maybe add that to the list, how to fertilize, because we're coming up on fertilizing time. So uh, how to fertilize, I might have put that in there. You're fertilizing three, probably for fruit trees, four times a year. If you're thinking holidays, so spring, summer, fall, winter. Okay, that's the time. If you're thinking holidays or triggers, think Easter. That's a great time to fertilize, especially fruiting plants, because they're just about to pop their flowers and start setting fruit. If you can fertilize them right then, you'll have larger fruits. For fruit trees, the, well, let's just go down the Easter, 4th of July is the summer one. So again, if you fertilize right now, the rains are coming, the food's sitting there, and so you'll get this, it's a second growing season. You, if you fertilize your roses, whole nother set of flowers. You fertilize your, your shade trees, whole nother set of growth. So it's a real opportunity. To, I think it's one of the best growing seasons when the monsoons hit. Best planting season, monsoons hit. The most important fertilizing, bar none, for anything that blooms in the, in the spring of the year is fall. And locals will use Halloween as that time. So when you see the aspens turning, color the mums are in bloom, you know, fall, autumn. Fertilize then your fruiting, fruiting plants. They're going to use that food to form next spring's flower buds. So if you want a lot of flowers on them. So if your lilacs didn't produce very well, that's probably because you didn't fertilize in the fall. It's using that food, food to form the spring flowers, the most important feeding. I think you should fertilize your, your edible things in winter, New Year's, and evergreens. Evergreens, they turn yellow. They call it winter chlorosis. If you fertilize them right then, they stay green. They're magnificent. If they don't, they get this yellow hue, especially desert or, or uh, or cedars, certain things kind of get kind of this off color. Yeah, they come around, but you want it to look good all the time. And once a little bit of food goes a long ways. But if you want to set a lot of flower buds and big flower buds, fertilizing right then makes it makes a difference. Okay. And then stay away, again, for the love of gardening, stay away from synthetic fertilizers. Don't use chemical fertilizers for edible plants. First of all, it's not organic. You should use organics and it's too easy to use organics. And what chemicals do is they burn your worms and stuff. So it's good for the plant, but it's terrible for the soil. Well, worms and mycorrhizal colony, all the living stuff in the soil, that's what makes fruits 
much, much better, bigger, stronger. It's just better. So organic fertilizers. And we happen to, since you're shopping at Waters Garden Center, we happen to sell our own fruit and vegetable food, completely organic. Okay, 6447. So another problem that we have is we have a lack of calcium. Actually, we have a lot of calcium. The pH is so high, it locks up all the minerals so, so the plants can't get to it. Okay, we know that. Let's just give them more. So we, we, we put 7% calcium in this. That's what gets rid of, just a second, that's what gets rid of blossom end rot on peppers and tomatoes. It helps your squash to form without dropping off. And it also gets your better flavor size on fruiting like apples, pears, cheap peaches, that kind of gets, gets a bigger, sweeter. The flavor comes out with calcium. So we just, we know that about our soil. So this is made for here by us. It's our recipe, our formula, and it's completely organic. Okay. So, yes, question. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so yeah. Okay. So, so, so yeah, mine, mine do the same thing. So this is an organic fertilizer. So it's made with organic stuff, which is like bone meal, meat meal, feather meal, all these meals. Animals like that. So they're going to be attracted to it. So you might go out. So for me, I'm going out and I sprinkle that on in a rainstorm. I'm trying to rake it in. I'm trying to get it in the ground because they like to nibble on the nuggets, basically. So if it's a real issue, it's not going to hurt them. I don't think. Don't let them free feed. Use some common sense. I got to say that. I mean, just don't put it in their their dog bowl. The common sense stuff. But other than that, there's no way they can pick up enough to really get to it. Um, but if it's a real problem, we have another product down there called all purpose food and it's not organic. It's all natural, but the main ingredient is bird guano and cottonseed meal. Those are two, they're, they're, those are organic, but, it, but we also put minerals in there. As soon as you put a mineral like iron, sulfur, those things, you can't call it organic. So, but it's, it's all natural. You might switch to that and they'll be less attracted to, to it. And it's just as good for fruit trees. I do this one for my hardcore, I mean, this is fruit trees, edible folks. Some of you are like hardcore to the point of vegan stuff. I mean, it's, and that's great. We made this for the hardcore organic folks, but we have two fertilizers. Animals tend to want to eat this. Yeah. Good thing is it probably keeps your rabbits down, pack rats, because it attracts predators and they know that. And so it smells like blood meal and bone meal, like something just died. So the animals that come and eat your strawberries, they're probably going to go, oh, my gosh, I'm not staying here. It's too dangerous. I'm going over there. So it could be a, a repulse kind of thing. Okay, food. Got that four times a year. Water. Let's go over the varieties. Okay, so you grow, we do not grow citrus. Okay, just get it out of your head. You can't have it. You're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Come on, we're up here in God's country. You cannot have citrus. I'll tell you what you can have. You can't have avocados. You can't have that for you California folks. They don't grow here. There's nothing you can do to make them grow. You could cheat, put them in a container, drag them indoors, slip them in the greenhouse, ship them out during the day. You can do that. But now that's gardener stuff. But if you're actually going to plant sustainable plants out in the yard for longevity, let's go with apples. Pears, cherries, peaches, apricots, nectarines, plums. You can grow all of these things that the Phoenix folks wish they could grow because they ask the same thing. Can I grow peaches down here? Well, there's one variety that grows. All the rest of them, no. We grow them all. The secret is stay away from the desert varieties. And you're, I'm going to touch on chilling hours. Which this gets into the science of it. But plants are programmed that after so many hours of freezing temperature, they bloom. It's like a, it's like a calculation. And they know, what, they know what the calculation is. And so we want plants up here that need at least 700 hours, chilling hours, before they bloom. And what's that, what that's going to do is it's going to allow them to start blooming closer to our last frost date. So it'll get them to bloom in April, May. So that's when you want your fruit trees. If you get them where they've only got two, some, some, some cherries, 200 hours. That thing's going to bloom in January and February. 
That's a desert variety. And unfortunately, a lot of our garden information and a lot of the buyers for the box stores are in Phoenix, they're ordering those desert varieties. You can find them up here. And it's nothing to do with the health of the plant. The tree will grow just fine, but it will never fruit for you. If you're planting a cherry tree, you want it to, you're planting it for the cherries. You're planting it for the plums, the apricots, okay? So look at your chilling hours or just shop at Waters Garden Center. We're only going to sell varieties that are up here that have proven themselves to produce fruit. So they're going to be the right age. So just do your, do your homework, though, and you'll have that handout shortly of the pollination guides and the varieties that grow up here. Okay, You'll have the whole list, all of it. Um, what else? Oh, let's go with which varieties do I start with? So the varieties that, that produce the best because they bloom latest in spring, apples and pears. If you're only going to pick one, pick one of those because they're very consistent. Every year we get apples and pears. It's very rare when we don't get apples and pears. Okay, the next variety that does the best, that produces the most consistently, cherries and peaches. They're the next ones to bloom. They're the latest, next latest to bloom in spring. So they're less they're less um, exposed to potential frost taking their fruit or their flower. Okay, so, so apples, pears, then cherries, peaches, then it's probably plums, apricots, and nectarines are the first ones to bloom. Even the latest blooming varieties. So there's only two, three that we sell here. So Chinese apricot, Tilton, and Mormon apricots. There's three that, that are the latest producing. That do, they, When they produced, uh, apricots are feast or famine. You either have so many, you better have the canning supplies and friends lined up to give bags to, or you'll have none. There's only two, two things with apricots. And so you never, about every third year, they seem to be frosted out. No matter how late they bloom, the frost just gets, it's that last freak storm that comes and just takes them. So you're going, oh, it's going to be a good apricot year. Oh my gosh, you got little tiny apricots in. It goes to freeze, it takes them out. Now, 28 degrees, you need to keep that in mind. 28 is the magic number. At 32 degrees, you'll lose about 10%. So if it's in bloom, and it's exposed or it's setting fruit at 32 degrees, you'll lose about 10% of your, your crop, your fruit. It won't affect the tree, just the fruit, okay? It'll take the fruit. And for every degree you go down, it takes about another 10%. 28 degrees, that's the number. At 28, all fruit is lost. All the flowers are dead, all, all. It's not gonna have fruit that year. It'll be a beautiful shade tree, great fall color, great, you'll, you'll enjoy taking a, Sip an iced tea, watching the sunset underneath the shade, but it's not going to have fruit. 28 is the magic number. If you're seeing that happen, we cover it. There's some techniques, and we share more of that in spring. If you're part of our garden club, we'll put out quick notices going, it looks like this is the event. Make your frost alert. Well, try to let everyone know. Cover, put a shop light. In summer, you all don't care about frost so much. I'm just putting that out there for your notes. 28 is the magic number. Don't let, don't let the tree go below 28 while it has fruit on it. All of these trees can go down to minus 20, minus 30 degrees, but they're not fruiting. It's when they're in fruit, 28 is the magic number, okay? All right. Apples. Pick the variety you like. We grow most of them. Just me. Honeycrisp, Fuji, Gala, Red Delicious. We, this is really good apple country. It does really well. Golden Delicious. They're all really good. Okay. You will need two. They need cross pollinators. Apples do better with buddies. And you can't have a honey crisp with a honey crisp. They, they need different varieties. The same will not pollinate the same. So you need a Gala and a Fuji. You'll need a Red Delicious and a Macintosh. You'll take two and you'll have that chart. It'll tell you. Or if you're coming in, we've got the chart on the end of each rack. Because we want we want to help you too. We want to make sure we get you the right so you're getting more. Now we do have some varieties, and I think I brought one here. Here. So we do have some. We're kind of famous for a couple different things. One, basically, I get bored with plants. I've sold so many plants, so thousands. I don't know, more than that. 
So we have grafted varieties. So we've grafted four different varieties of pears onto one branch. This is not natural. This is a, a pear rootstock. First of all, we've got grafted roots. We're taking a rootstock that's designed for clay soils. Most of us have clay. So we're getting a rootstock that adapts to clay better. Then we graft onto that root the variety that we want. So we get an exact clone of that exact, the perfect plant, take a cut, out, cut into that, and then we grow it. And as it grows up, we're grafting different varieties onto that same branch. So we can get four different varieties. If you've got four on the same, we're grafting the varieties that pollinate each other. This is perfect for a smaller backyard, just off the backyard. If you just need one tree, but you want a pear, pears need doubles. They need two different varieties. Some yards can't take on two varieties. This is this will get you out of it. Plus, it's just fun. The other beauty of this is you got four, you got reds, greens, yellows all on the same tree, and they don't all ripen at the same time. So you can harvest all of the the, the, the bosk, and then you can go to the Bartlett's, then you go to the, so you, you're not harvesting like five bushels all at once. It's one bushel a week over the next month. That's another beauty of, of grafted varieties. We do that for pears, apples, uh, pitted fruits like ch uh, uh, apricots, and we can cross pollinate or graft on different pitted fruits. So apricots, peaches, that kind of stuff on the same tree. That's something you'll see over there. The other one you'll notice is there's different sizes. So there are three, three basic sizes of trees. There's standard. If it just says Honeycrisp, that's a standard size tree. A, a, an apple tree is going to get about 25, 30 feet tall. It's like a miniature shade tree. So standard shade trees goes up 70 feet. So that's cottonwoods, willows, sycamores. Those are big trees. Uh, apples are half of that size. Pears are half of that size. Then what you have is semi-dwarf. So we're taking, we're controlling that with the rootstocks. We graft on a different rootstock. It keeps it a little bit smaller. Semi-dwarf will be about 20, 30% smaller than its traditional standard size. It's still a tree, but it's just a click down. So it's easier to pick fruits, basically. You can take a fruit picker and just get to it, but it's still gonna be a tree. And then you get genetic dwarf. This is actually a pint-sized tiny tree, but it has the same size fruit. So this happens to be a nectarine. I brought it to inspire you all because it's starting to get close to ripening. These you use as ornaments in containers in the middle of a flower bed. It's just beautiful. It's, it's this beautiful little tiny, gets about this tall, kind of round shaped. It's just pretty, but you're never gonna take your lounge chair and bask underneath the shade. It's not, it's too small for that. So same size fruit, but smaller. So it's not for everyone, but there's a place for it. We sell quite a few. I think over there right now, we've got a pixie peach, nectarine. There's two or three varieties of true genetic dwarfed, tiny pint sized trees, okay? Fruit trees. Yeah. Oh, that's good. June, great, great question. Thank you for asking that. So how far do plants, how close do plants need to be to help pollinate each other? So bees are bees and moths, they're doing the work. Okay, honeybees are the number one. Okay, they're cross pollinated and they are dumb as mud. Okay, they do not, they get derailed with anything. As long as they're line of sight, they'll go hundreds of feet, hundreds of yards. They'll go the next yard, the next couple of yards over. But if you put a house or a barn or a garage or something in between that, it's over. So just don't put a structure between the trees. And I find the bees, they seem to do the work for you. So the other secret is pollination charts. Make sure they're blooming at the same time. That's what that chart is. They're blooming at the same time so the bees can help pollinate each other. It's mainly for apples, pears, and cherries. They really benefit from pollinators. There's a few varieties. I think Bartlett pear produces fruit by itself, so it's self-fruitful, but it will actually produce more fruits and larger fruits if it has a pollinator buddy. So it actually will produce more if you can give it a pollinator. So, but there are some that'll produce by themselves. Cherries, there's, a, there's probably three or four varieties that are self-fruitful, 
but they do better with, so the classics are black tartarian and Bing cherries. They are like the sweetest, most delicious dark cherries. They melt in your mouth. My water must be close to lunch or something. So my mouth just watered. Uh, peaches, they're all, every single one of them, self-fruitful. Apricots, every one of them, self-fruitful. One, that's all you need. It's got male and female on the same plant, okay? And that'll be that'll be your great, great question. Hopefully we answer that. So anywhere without a, without a structure in front of them. Let me start with here. Let's cover a couple things. Let's go blueberries. It's the hardest ones to grow. Never start with blueberries. Blueberries like very acidic, moist soil. Well, we have very <laughs> alkaline, dry soil. So these you can grow, but it takes a gardener. I grow them in containers or raised beds so I can control the soil. And I want a lot of peat moss because peat moss is drains really well and it's very acidic. They love that. And so in my containers, it's a pretty plant. It blooms, it fruits, it's got everything you want for a container garden. So they're just pretty. Uh, berries do tend to, blueberries specifically tend to do better with buddies. So they'll you two different varieties. So here I've got Northland and Patriot. Those are two classics that, that cross pollinate each other and you get more berry. You're just seeing they're, they're pollinating each other right there in the racks. So they're, they've helped each other just pollinate. Those will be ripe in another, I don't know, a couple of weeks, two, three weeks. Maybe ripe right now, we'll see. I wonder if they are ripe. Let's see. Oh, another, another couple of days. <laughs> I brought blueberries because everyone loves them. They'll be a little bit smaller fruit, but they are sweeter than you've ever tasted. They, they'll put Costco's berries to shame. It's just so delicious. But what I would start with, blackberries and raspberries. I brought these two varieties. These are the ones that I grow. Not that they're the only varieties, but they're thornless. So some blackberries and raspberries... You're picking the fruit and it looks like you've been in a cat fight by the time you get the fruit picked. And they're quite delicious. They're very large berries, very sweet. So little, I'll take the grandkids out. We will eat until we are, our face and our hands are just black from picking so many berries. You can have bushels, not bushels, bowls and bowls of berries. It's very easy to grow. So I've got boysen, marion, black, um, a little bit of flavor difference. I think it really, now this, now I'm going to make the county, Marion County very angry. I apologize. I can't tell a difference between Marion berries and blackberries. They're the same. One comes from Marion country because they call they're very proud. If they were, if they were figured out here, I call them Prescott berries, that kind of thing. So it's more of a regional thing. Like what's the difference between Cabernet and, and Zippendale? It's the region they're grown in, some soil difference. So um, I grow them all. Raspberries do really well here. That was a canberry raspberry. Again, it's the only one that is thornless. Raspberries are really aggressive. They have tiny little thorns on them. So you always kind of get them in your hand. So I go with the thornless one. They don't produce, I find, quite as well but I'd rather have that in a bigger bramble than I would thorned varieties that are just harder to pick. That's just ease. They're all pretty, they all produce well. Another one too, you might watch. So berries, just a second. Um, they come on, they, they fruit on second year wood. So this is what I taught the, uh, my staff at the staff meeting last week. So this is a raspberry. This cane that grows up, or maybe this is blackberry. This is a blackberry, Marion berry. This is a long cane that comes up. That cane that grows this year, it's not going to produce. It's growing that cane out to produce fruit next year. So berries produce on second year wood. So a little trick that I do myself, this is just, again, I'm just Ken. It works for me. I think it'll work for you. Um, as that cane grows, right now it's starting to flower and fruit. Just as I see a, a little bit of color on that berry, I'll hang some, some bird tape on there to scare them off because they're eyeballing them just like you are. They're waiting and they'll come and they'll peck every single fruit to see which one's the best. They're never content. They don't eat one and just keep, then move to the next one. They pick them all. 
And so I know they're eyeballing them when I am. So I put that, don't put the bird tape on too soon or they get used to it. Put it on just as it's starting to show color and that'll keep the birds off pretty well. It's pretty successful. Okay, and then I leave that tape on there. Sometimes I'll put a, a tail about that big. Sometimes I'll shorten it up, but I keep it on that, that cane as an idea of which ones to remove in the winter. Because you'll forget that when, when they all go dormant, you can't tell them which one was, you think you could remember. I don't think it's age. I just think it all looks the same. I keep it as, a, as an ID going to thin that one out. So you always want to thin out that last year's wood. So it makes, so it puts all that energy into the new, new cane. So you always want to grow new canes, kind of like a rose, kind of the same way. Makes sense? It's a big, big mistake I, folk find, I find folks make. So marionberry, raspberries, blackberries are all over there. You can plant them right now. They'll probably produce some fruit this year. They'll produce a lot of fruit next year, okay? Then we'll go down the line to grapes. We got to cover that. I brought this one because it's my new favorite. This is this is zestful. The zestful series. Grapes are so ginormous. I mean, they take up real estate. You got to I mean, these things grow 15, 20 feet in diameter. They're huge. They're hard to control. They want to take over. If you stand still for a moment, they'll attach themselves and try to take take you on. If they can. They're just aggressive. Zestful is a is a semi dwarfed variety that still puts the big clusters of, of fruit on. So it's less aggressive. So now we can have these up a smaller trellis, up a, a patio, uh, down a fence line, and it's not gonna take over the whole thing. You grow it in containers. Uh, there's, I think, red and green over there, seedless table grapes. But you can also grow wine grapes just as well. This is pretty good grape country. Uh, certain varieties do better than others, but Concords, Thompson's, they all grow really, really well here. Again, I find, it's probably my irrigation, the, 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 the uh, grapes are a little bit smaller than they would be, let's say, in Northern California. They're perfect environment, but they're sweeter. So, and they produce very, very well. Uh, they tend to be heavy feeders. So I tend to fertilize this one a little more often, about every six, eight weeks. I tend to give a little bit of that fruit and berry food. I just give a little bit of that fruit tree, fruit, fruit food. That seems to keep them, keep them going. Organics are super important for berries. They prefer organic fertilizers over chemicals. It seems to make a difference. If you get the chemical too strong, they just shed their fruit. If you make one mistake, they shed their fruit. Organics, they don't do that with. In the back. Wild blueberries? No, not, not the ones you find in, in like Minnesota in that area. Yeah, Maine. We're getting varieties that are more uh, smaller. The smaller ones tend to take on our dryness. It's about the dryness better than, let's say, those big, big bushes that are up in the wilder north cold country. It's a big bush, yeah. These are probably better for you. If you want the berry, this is probably a better one. If you want the bush, there's way better varieties for the bushes. Uh, currants, this is the best one. Or here, let's just go to keep going on the line. Here. You folks from Phoenix, can I grow figs? Yes, you can. Figs grow up here, but they don't produce trees. You'll never see a fig tree here. Down in Phoenix, they grow up in the size of shade trees. They're huge and messy. Here they grow into bushes. So they'll get up about this big and they kind of get like this. Okay. And the reason that is our cold tends to reset them and turn them into perennials. They'll hibernate underground. They got to re come back up from the roots fresh. So it seems to reset them. So you'll do that every three or four or five years. It seems like they just reset them. So they never get the substantial tree that you're used to. Let's say down the desert. This is Desert King. It goes down to minus 30 degrees. So again, we're trying to get Chicago Hardy, the ones that go that take the cold. Some figs do not like cold. So stay, be careful the desert varieties. We're some of the ones that will take our... Our, it's the winter that kind of resets them up here. So figs will grow here, though. And it's traditional, melt in your mouth, like sized fig. The other one, similar to that, Tucson's famous for their pomegranates. You can grow. There is a variety that does well up here. Again, it's a little bit shorter than you'd find in the desert. But these things love 
full sun, hot. Take a blow dryer to kick dirt at it, curse at it. It's still going to grow a nice pomegranate. Okay, so yes. Uh, I don't know, to tell you the truth, but we'll look at the sign after this. Okay. So I'm not under pressure. Did someone else have a sign question that I blew past? So, yeah. I've got Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great question. Great question. So I uh, should have covered that. So standard semi dwarf dwarf. Do they all pollinate each other? And the answer is yes. They pollinate just fine as long as the variety that you're looking at. So a semi dwarfed um, honey crisp and a standard size gala. Those are going to pollinate each other just fine. No matter what. No matter what size. Okay, yeah. 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 Oh, good. Okay, so we have a full-on tree right here. It's an apple tree, starting from apples. What variety is this? Honeycrisp. So we got a honeycrisp apple. It's setting fruit. Why wouldn't I just keep it right there in the pot? You could do that for about a year, and then eventually it's going to need more soil than that. Eventually, they're going to overgrow their, their space. So you could keep them in this bucket. This will stay in this bucket for a year or two and be fine, but eventually get root bound. And once those roots start going round and round, they don't stop. They just don't. I don't care if you root print them. They keep doing that. You really don't want it a root bound tree, especially for a fruit tree. So none of ours are. are that's a carryover. You're going to see that a lot at box stores because they're they're taking that. There's a hundred of them left. To go. I'll take them all. From last year, they've already started the spiral. No matter what you do, you can't get them to undo that. And so we're trying to bring in varieties that just that'll just root right out and not do this spiral thing. Anyway, you could keep this easily in, in this for a year. Also, what happens is um, you, there's less room for a mistake. So if you make this will go, probably need to water this every two three days. If you go on vacation, you're gone for a week. Will it be alive when you get back? Did the water Plant person, let's take care of the dog. Forget or not forget. I seem to always lose plants whenever we travel. In a container, it'd be a lot easier. Yeah. How cool. often do you get these in? I mean, because I, I came here a few weeks ago. I want to buy a bunch. You said we have fruit. So why don't we get these instead of, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So how often do we get them? So there's going to be main we get them almost every at least once a month we're getting some fruit trees but there are big seasons and march april is when we really stock up so that's our biggest time right now like we just got in a whole whole crop of the dwarf we found some we go, oh we ran out in march we found some we, we'll take them all so we grab so you see some so it just depends what happens truly with crops so they're really nice crop. We, we grow. The computers tell us you're going to need 50 of these. We go, okay, let's go for it. And then the community says, no, we wanted 65. And so you run out like that, or you only need 45. So you have too many. You're trying to get it close. Uh, but as those crops run out, you can't just hit a button and it spins out 15 more. They're, the crop's gone for this year. And it seems like the big ones are gone first. Then it's the smaller ones. Uh, and then it's the, the tiny ones are left at the end of the year. But you can plant here year round as long as you're watering, planting correctly. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, I'll bet you do. We all do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or jackhammer. Yeah, yeah. Good question. So she's asking, she's growing in rock. Can I grow a fruit tree in that? And the answer is yes. Let me show you how. Let me take one that I can actually lift up. Let's take, uh, let's just take this one. It's a peach tree. So the root ball, and you'll have this planting guide in your in your inbox here by Monday. The root ball is going to be the same size, same depth as the bucket, three times as wide. Fruit trees, their roots go sideways. There is this tap root is a total myth. There is no tap root because a rock. It hits a rock, goes okay. I'll just go this way, or this. They go sideways. If you know that's how our native plants are growing, how uh, ornamental your plant is going to grow, just create a create a root ball that's create a, a hole that's like that. 
Um, then you're going to need, especially if you're in rocks, you're going to need some organic stuff in there because all you got is rocks. Anything bigger than a golf ball is bad. Screen it. Screen it. Get it out of there. It heats up in summer. It doesn't hold enough water molecules to keep it. Yeah. I'm getting that. I get you. Hold on. I, I hear you, sister. I hear you. So I got this. Yeah, I'm going to help you. So dig the hole. You got you to gotta be able to dig a hole. You can't chip out a rock. It's not going to grow in that. But you're seeing rocks. You're seeing plants grow out of crevices. So pick a spot where you think you can get enough of a hole. And the secret is going to be test it before you plant. So dig the hole. Fill it up with water in the morning. If water is still sitting there at the end of the day, you didn't dig a hole, planting hole, you dug a bathtub. Things are not going to grow there. So there we'll take a jackhammer digging bar. We call it a chimney. We'll take a portion of that hole and just try to chip it out to the next layer. So soil is coming in layers or rocks come in layers. Sometimes you get through that caliche layer. You can now, it'll start to perk or drain. As soon as it starts draining, the tree will grow there. If it doesn't drain, it's never going to grow there, no matter... Now, you folks out in the valley areas, that uh, Dewey, Prescott Valley, all the way up to Paulden, it's just heavy clay out there with caliche layers. So it's a gray, kind of almost like cement. Water does not penetrate it. If you run into that, you all, a technique that I've really helped me, as I lived out there in the 90s, um, is plant on a slight mound. So dig your hole the same depth but leave about that much, leave two, three, four inches of the root ball out of the ground and then mound the soil up to it. Put your drip emitter on top of that or put your water basin around that. So that'll ensure mainly in summer during the monsoons that at least that much of the roots can breathe. Whatever you do, don't listen to Phoenix. They're gonna tell you to plant in the divot, help your rain harvest. You do not want that. They don't get rain down there enough to bother with we do and we get cool at night so things don't dry out there's still 100 degrees out at midnight we got down to 60. it's a totally different growing environment so don't you want that so this root ball that you see here should still be showing should still be breathing don't bury it and don't put it below ground put it at ground or in the heavy clay areas put it slightly above ground that will reduce your mortality rate down to almost nothing. Just that one tip alone will really greatly reduce your, your, your mortality rate, okay? Yeah, did I, did I answer that? So rocks, so check the perk, and then you're gonna need a, probably a little bit more mulch. So you'll need three things when you plant. You need mulch. This is our compost, screen down to quarter inch minus, and it's locally sourced. We get this out of Taylor, Arizona, it's an old sawmill. We screen it down real tight and it looks like compost. It looks like chocolate. You folks in the Midwest, you call a mulch just like bark. No, this is not bark. This is actually composted material, okay? And it's made to add to our native soil that is crummy and keep it for clay soil. It's made to keep it fluffier so the roots can get through it. And it encourages worms and micro mycorrhizal colonies, all the good stuff in the soil. It encourages that for clay soil that's good for sandy soil. It holds, it gives you some, some organics to hold the soil around the root ball because sand just wants to go whoosh. It holds it in there around there. Okay. For me, insider tip, I do sprinkle every time I plant a little bit of aqua boost crystals underneath my plants. These are polymers that swell up and hold like 200 times their weight in water. And then we've infused them with mycorrhizal colonies that these are the these are, oh, now we're going really deep. This is like gardening 501. But anyway, the mycorrhizals attach themselves onto plant roots and extend the roots out. There's a symbiotic thing that happens, but it really helps fruiting plants. Uh, tomatoes, anything that forms a fruit or a flower really helps them because it helps them extend their roots. And it, it, it mitigates the dry to, to wet sequence. We, it, you're better off watering the morning, like before the heat of the day. Plants prefer that. They don't like being watered at night because they stay wet. They get fungal issues. Morning's best and then they dry out. Well, this helps to regulate that dry to, to moisture. Really important for, for bigger fruits, uh, well, tomatoes, they, they swell. Sometimes they'll crack or get a real thin 
thick uh, skin to them. That's that wet to dry. It's def defense. It's, it's that swelling of the fruit causes that. This helps reduce that. Aquaboost is really, this is a, something that we don't push that often. We should do it more, but for my friends, great little product. I kind of get a bottle every year and just kind of, as I plant, I sprinkle a little bit down there. When it's all planted, so you're mixing about 25% mulch to your native soil. You screened out anything bigger than a golf ball. You screen it out. What's left over, you add the mulch, blend it together, backfill around the root ball. When it's all done, I'll water it in with root and grow. This is compost tea. They are going to freak out. This is it, the home it's known for the last several years. You just threw it into Arizona soil. It's not going to like you. It's going to go into shock. This helps transplant shock. I use this every two weeks until I see the plant stabilize and starting to grow, and then I cut it off. It doesn't need this anymore. So mix in a watering can, three tablespoons of a gallon of water. When I'm all done, I'll water, I'll sprinkle in some of this, the food. I'll just sprinkle a handful of this around there. This is what's going to feed it over the next three months or so. Keep it growing because you want more foliage, more roots. This is what's going to get it more roots. And that's your three things. So mulch, food, root and grow. I would say aqua boost, the crystals. It's it really helps. If you're in a windy spot, if you're in the valley areas at all, you're gonna need stakes. Because if that tree starts to grow, and it, it'll it'll grow to the northeast, because we get a prevailing southwest wind that happens when it's in, when it's leafed out. It'll start to lean to the northeast. As that tree loads up with fruit, it's very likely to fall over. You want it growing straight, straight as an arrow, straight up. Don't let the wind push it. If you see that, put a stake on it. We try to make it easy for you. So I brought my stake kit because we know we need to sell more stakes. Two stakes, a V-strap and some wire, enough to stake a tree, $19.99. We're trying to get you to get more because it's so important. Also, another tip I've had, stay away from the small stakes. They wiggle out of the ground. Our wind is so much, it wiggles. They just come out of there. You need a slodge pole. It needs to be bigger so it doesn't wiggle. Just And then you get in, should it be northeast, southwest? I don't care where the stake is. Just put two stakes. Tie it once. We want it to move but not lean over and grow to the northeast. So stakes, if you're in a windy area, some of you aren't. You've got a courtyard. It's not a big deal. You're in a backyard where it's just you get the walls to kind of protect it. Don't worry about it. If you're exposed, probably you need to stake things for one year, maybe two for a really small thing. Some of your neighbors, those the tree is holding the stakes up anymore. That's too long. So you could take them off, usually after two years. What I tell my customers, clip off, the if you're not sure, clip off the, the tie between the stakes, see how that tree performs as that spring wind hits. So you could easily retie it if you want, but if it goes through the first, if it goes through May and it's still fine, pull the stakes up, break them off. Driving the stakes in the ground, that's the hard part. So leave them in until you're for sure no, but try it, see what happens, yeah. As deep as you can, so how deep do you put the stakes? I would say at least a foot. If you can go down 18 inches, that's ideal, uh, but sometimes you can't. You hit a rock, go that far. If you're in clay and you're just worn out trying to get this thing through there, that's probably far enough. So usually about as deep as the root is good enough. That's why I think put them in right after you plant because you've already dug this much. Okay, that's probably getting you close plus a little bit more, probably enough. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, right. So how do you time nature? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> this year was unusual, so it was freakish. It was very wet and it was cold for a very long time. I mean, it's unusual for us to be cold into May. And then it finally got nice and it's been nice. Usually we're at 95 degrees now. It's beautiful. It's like everything is a month delayed. So I don't know, I'm hoping for monsoons. We don't have summer, that typical 90. We can see 100 every once in a while. Not very much, but it'll bump there and that cools off. We haven't even come close to that. So it's an unusual year. Um, I would suggest 
you need to become a beekeeper. That would help you. Grow, make your own honey. It's surprising how many people grow have their own bee colonies. Anyone, anyone doing bees? No, chickens? Yeah, I knew there was always some. Bees and chickens seem to be the thing right now. So we've got an hour and 10. So we're going over a little bit of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we are seeing just some bee, because I'm in ag, I kind of serve on some of the ag, ag on a statewide level. Um, the, the, the domesticated bees are still in trouble. We're still having problems keeping the colonies. There's a, there's, a, there's a mite or something we're trying to figure out at the university level. We haven't quite figured it out yet. Uh, the native bee populations are very healthy and growing, but that's not enough to keep an entire cotton crop or citrus order or, you know, all the things that we grow, it's not enough. You need to domesticate it, bring it in while they are blooming, but the uh, native varieties are, are quite healthy. And that's probably what's on your, your lavender bush in the yards right now. Okay. Yep. Two. Yep. Okay. Yep. July 4th. Oh, good. That'll be big. Yeah. So, so no class next week because it's July 4th. I'm going to the rodeo. Reason for that. And then uh, July 8th will be gardening for newcomers. This is kind of a, it's a lot of kind of 30,000 foot level. Here's the frost dates. Here's what, here's way, way more information than, than we went here. Here we went deep. This will be real light going wide. Uh, and it's usually a very popular. Come a little bit early. Bring, bring a, bring a, uh, I don't know, a chair. There might not be enough chairs. And then I do like lattes. So you get favored, you get favored treatment if you bring one of those. Iced or hot, I don't care, either one. So yeah, it starts at 9.30. All the classes now through fall are at 9.30. And then uh, another thing I, I noticed too, it's popular last week, I should mention it. Um, if you need help, if, you're st if you just need more one-on-one -on -one time, we do have a service for that. You do have to buy a gift card, but if you do, you get an hour's worth of dedicated time to spend your card. I'm finding my, my really smart gardeners that are doing bigger projects, they'll buy a card, they'll come in, schedule a time, usually it's in the morning, lunch times is always crazy. Morning, afternoon, we just have, we go through and we help you walk through that part of the yard or line up those kind of trees or get that hedgerow. And I'm finding that folks are buying another guarded consult, buying a second one. They're lining up, depending on where they're guarding, what they're doing, they're buying another gift card, mainly just for the dedicated consultation time. So it's our way of, of I think it's a $250 card. You get an hour's worth of time to spend it. So it's a good good technique for just one tree. It's not worth it. Just take, take a picture, bring it in, we'll look at it. But if you've got a whole project, it's a good kind of insider tip that might help you with the staff, okay? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. If you spend 250 bucks with you, we'll dedicate an hour's worth of time with you. It's not, it's not time, we'll help you spend your gift card here. That's what it is, does that make sense with that? So you're not buying our time, you're buying plants, we're helping you buy your plants, That's, does that make sense? And folks are buying multiple of those, we're seeing folks buying three or four or five of those throughout the growing season as they do, and they've got beautiful gardens, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Let's see which one do I have that's got the best. This has got a really good graph. Let's just see. No, you can't see it. Let me see if I got one that's you can see on camera. So this is so she's got a peach tree. This is an apple. She's got a peach tree. And it's been damaged probably by winter or bugs or something. And part of it's dead, but it's starting to come up from the roots. Now, that's not desirable. The thing that is coming from the roots is a wild variety, typically not a desirable fruit, and you never know what you're going to get. If you just want to have fun and see what's going on, that's great. Gardeners are like that. But if you want that ranger peach or that Alberta peach or that what was up there, that's not going to be that. 
So this is it's coming up from the wild variety, and this is the magic. This is the graft. So I showed this one. This is the this is the original rootstock we're grafting onto. This is the actual graft, and now it's starting to to as 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 that trunk grows, this will disappear. It just grows into a big tree. But you'll see this texture change always, where the graft was in here. If it's coming up above the graft, it will be the same variety of peach. So it depends on if it's coming from the soil, not good. Above the graft is good. With pitted fruits, we have noticed, it's just a trend this year, there's a real pretty little clear-winged wasp. She's cute as can be. It's called a um, peach tree borer. So she lays her eggs at the base of pitted fruits, cherries, apricots, nectarines, peaches, and the larvae hatches and burrows into the trunk. And you'll see, you'll know that you've got them because you'll see these bubbles of sap or sometimes the sap will run, you'll see running. And typically it's from this level down. It's not up in the tree, it's mainly at the base or the trunk or the main crotch. If you see any sap coming from a tree, be very worried. Come talk to us, we can fix this. But if you let it go too far, they'll burrow or they girdle all the, they're eating the live wood just underneath the bark, the cambium layer, they're eating that. They eat all the way around, the tree will die. Usually it happens in June, so it'll be fine. Oh, I'm okay. Oh, it's fine. It's fine. And that first warm day, it dies in like a day or like a couple days. It just collapses all at once because it was girdled. So kind of watch for that. We've seen that one. We do see some um, um, apple moths. So there's a codling moth, a little tiny, cute little wasp. Get moth, a little tiny little thing, but she likes to lay her eggs on apples and pears. So especially if you're in an area that it's been out there for a while and there's been a lot of apples and pears, that's where they tend to congregate and they migrate very easily onto the next fruit tree. If you're in a new subdivision, it's just you're just new, probably isolated. If you get any worms in your apples or your pears, that's only one thing. It's called a coddling moth. And we, there's some sprays that we can show you how to keep those under control. It's BT. I think I might have brought some of that, did I? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, a couple of things. So, um, caterpillar killer will take out codling moth and tomato worms. Anything that eats any kind of wormy kind of thing, it takes them out and it's organic. Uh, we're seeing a lot of this is the number one seller right now as of this week because of grasshoppers. There's a little tiny black beetle about like this starting to show up on tomatoes and vegetable gardens we're seeing. And so, we're starting to use this. So, we're shifting from organics to harsher things because the bugs are more difficult to kill as their exoskeletons start to get larger, they're harder to kill. You need stronger stuff. This is as safe as we can go. Uh, this is a replica of an organic, but it's still synthetic. It's not organic, but it's as safe as you can get and still be effective. So it's called indoor outdoor spray. This would be a, this would be a, a foliar spray. So you'd spray the, the weeds where the grasshoppers are walking around. If you hit them, they'll die. Uh, if you if they, if they'll eat the grass, they'll die. They'll die. And it has about a week long kind of thing going for it. So we're just seeing a lot of this. Just kind of put it on your radar just so you know what to look for. Uh, and then you folks that have gophers, I'll leave you with this. We do have a cage it's made of stainless steel and it's expandable. So it's, it's, a, it's a fine gauge and it doesn't rust in the ground like chicken wire does. So if you have gophers, they love, love, love fruit trees. It's their favorite. They're gonna come after them, protect them, or kill them. I, they're an underground rat, an old Southern boy. They deserve, all rats deserve to die. Just kill them off. It's kind of hard. This is an easy way. It's a little expandable. We've got a one gallon, five gallon, 15 gallon size. It's a big net, basically, you plant in. That's that's a good, inexpensive way to keep the gophers from eating your roots, okay? With that, because we can go on for hours, I'm going to let you go. Before you do, uh, and I'll hang out as long as you want. I'll, I'll be here as long as you want. But I got to let the folks on time. They're already going to the refrigerator. The coffee cup's gone, isn't it? So you got to go. Uh, but I'll let you clap before you... Kind of go, yeah. Come to dancing for the stars. We'll like, uh, we'll dance for you. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'll show you this. Here you go. These shoes actually light up. Let's see if I can get them to sparkle. 
I'm thinking about wearing them at on stage. They look really good. So I don't. Everyone asks me where do I find these online. You can find everything online. They go with a shirt. My dance partner has this very pretty silver sequins, long, flowing thing. I don't know. There might be boas involved. I have no idea. We haven't gotten to the costume stage yet. I'm meeting with the uh, Yevpai College lighting technical team, which they're very sophisticated there. They've got every. We're gonna have fog in our in our in our performance light stuff and they can do all that stuff it's amazing actually we've got such talent here in this town i'm not talking about me i'm business talent but i'm not dance talent but yep my college is amazing so anyway thank you all for tuning in ciao take your time remember 10 percent off trees go for it yeah any any fruiting vines grapes figs or anything we talked about today yeah go for it showed it off i don't pick the dog <laughs>